chairman of the board of fair. Um, and for those of you who maybe joined us today for the first time, you were not able to join us yesterday, uh, give you a very brief background on fair. Fair is an organization that is dedicated to defending the church, its leaders, its, pra uh, its practices and doctrine against those who either have misunderstandings or who have, for whatever reason, taken it upon themselves to um, find criticism with the church. Apologetics, by definition, means to defend. Um, and I apologize, and I'm not the greatest apologist, but uh, I'm here to laugh at one. Um, but uh, my involvement with this actually comes from, from a couple of different directions. One, one of the founding members of FAIR was actually a member of my board, and I got involved in that way. But my interest comes because of my participation uh, in apologetics because of my many years of activity uh, simply as in missionary work. I was baptized at the age of 19. I lived in Portland, Oregon, and a friend of mine who was a member of the church but inactive came to my home, and my dad had uh, kind of raised me with this um, inquisitive kind of mind. He used to argue with me uh, just for the sake of teaching my mind, he used to say, and I, I, I'm not sure that, that was exactly the reason why he did it, but um, what that did was, when this friend of mine showed up and started talking about this golden book that fell from heaven or something, I, uh, I decided that I'd, have, I'd, I'd at least take this guy on and have a little bit of fun with him. The problem was that the more I tried to challenge him, the more difficult it was for me to do that because everything that he told me, I believe, and because of that, and because later I learned that many of the feelings I was having as I, um, as I had these discussions with this individual, well, as soon as I learned that these were the spirit, it was impossible for me to not want to be a part of that. And so I joined the church. Um, I went on a mission 18 months later. By the time I came back from my mission, I had been, uh, I learned most of the hymns in Spanish. I served a mission in Panama. I learned most of the hymns in Spanish because I didn't, I only sang once a week. And uh, as, a, as a member before my mission, I sang virtually every day. And so I learned all these hymns in Spanish. And on my mission, I started, that's when I got my first taste of, actually a little bit before my mission, that's when I got my first taste of um, anti-Mormonism. And what I discovered was is that um, it was, a lot of it was based on falsehood and misunderstanding. What I learned was is that those that, that I had to deal with were not necessarily the perpetrators of the misinformation, but those that were affected by them. Um, my very first experience with this was two months after I joined the church, uh, the Godmakers came to a local community church that was going to be shown. A group of my friends and I decided we were going to go to this specifically because we felt that this was wrong, this was, this was not right. I'd never seen the Godmakers, to be honest. I'd never been to the temple, of course. But I went and I attended this, and of course we showed up, we were the only ones in suits, so we stood out like sore thumbs. We were seated right in the front row, and the first thing that the, uh, the, the, the pastor there said, was he says, okay, he says, at the end of this we're going to have questions, but no testimonies. Um, so he, he shut us down at the very beginning. We weren't really planning on it. But the, the interesting thing that happened was we prayed the entire meeting that the people would not be affected by anything that was untrue. And Ed Decker was supposed to come and speak. He was one of the gentlemen responsible for that, um, that document, the, the God Makers. And we prayed the entire time that the people would not be affected. And at the end of the meeting, he was supposed to show up. And for whatever reason, he couldn't make it. We got up with the pastor afterwards. We said, you know, we'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind. He hushed, ushered us into one of his private rooms. And uh, we started to talk to him. And he brought in, actually another gentleman came in, a pastor from another church came in. And just as he came in, we were telling him, we said, you know, we wanted to talk to you because many of the things that were presented in that film, The Godmakers, are not true. And just as we were saying that, this other pastor said, uh, wait a minute. You're telling me that much of what I just saw is not true? And we said, yes. And he says, then I want to know more. And um, we had several discussions. I won't go through the exchange. But basically, at the end of that um, exchange, we agreed to this other pastor who had stepped in from this other church.
that we would send the missionaries over, which we did. I'd like to tell you that this pastor was converted to the church and, and uh, all this type of thing. That didn't happen. But what did happen was he canceled the Godmakers coming to his church. In some ways, that was a mixed blessing. We, we got one person who now had a more favorable opinion of the church, who perhaps in the past would have, um, would have attacked it. But more importantly, or, or actually ironically, what, uh, what we had found was, in, in my experience in the church, just to kind of outline this a little bit, um, after I returned from my mission, I went and I taught at the Missionary Training Center where I had the privilege of working with uh, teaching the missionaries, teaching the teachers of the missionaries, and later working with mission presidents to help prepare them when they would come in in the summers. And uh, then when I was released from, when I, when I left BYU and left the Missionary Training Center, um, I was later called as a board mission leader and as a state mission president. I studied. My entire life virtually, except for the last few years, have been in missionary service. And I've had lots of opportunities to see the results of the work of those who have attacked the church and the impact that it has on the innocent individuals who themselves want to know the truth. Um, as a result of all of this, it has been my observation that these individuals that are impacted by these falsehoods are good, honest, upstanding individuals. Those, the, those that perpetrate the misinformation are a very small, select few. It is not the mission of FAIR to take on that small, select few. Our mission is to address the issues they raise and plan in the hearts and the minds of those who are seeking the truth. Those are the people that we seek to help. Those are the ones that we desire to serve. The, uh, the early days of the church was filled very much with incidences of attack. The nature of the attack that took place, of the attacks that would take place in the early days of the church, were different than they are today. Back in those days, you had pastors who themselves felt threatened. Perhaps they were not well-educated individuals. These were people, they were frontiersmen, most of them. They were rugged individualists. They came out. Some of them had sincere desires. Others of them had more uh, selfish reasons for what they were doing based on, on religion. But many of them felt threatened by what Mormonism represented. And they took it upon themselves to go out and actually actively in a way, demonize the church, its leaders, its practices, etc. That's what brought much of the persecution onto the church in the early days. The church, because of that, found it necessary to take an active role in defending itself. Many of the early periodicals, I mentioned this yesterday, were started specifically because of these attacks on the church. Um, and there were several individuals, virtually all of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles were very active apologists. They wrote tracts and pamphlets. The original tracts oftentimes were written to explain many of the attacks that were brought upon the church. It is my belief that these attacks on the church is what made the church strong. Had there not been the opposition and the persecution in the early days of the church, we would have had soft, easy individuals that would have joined onto the church, and we wouldn't have the strong coalescence of membership that formed because of the persecution. There was no allowance for fencing. The persecution forced people to make a decision. And those that took the decision to defend and be on the side of the church became firm members. I remember reading uh, one of the pioneer accounts about crossing the plains saying that the faith that they developed crossing the plains was so much that even though they lost their entire family crossing the plains, they would do it again. These members did this willingly. It was the very sacrifices because of the persecution that made them as strong as they were. Joseph Smith made the statement that in order for the Lord to exalt us, He would try us every whip. And I believe that that's true. The opposition that is placed upon us as individuals and as a church, whether it be in our personal lives or in our, in our lives as church members, is placed there to help exalt us. And it's the process of us doing our own searching, our own finding, that develops the spiritual maturity that will allow us to be exalted. 
As the church went into this persecution mode, it, was, it, wasn't, it didn't choose it. It was placed in it. 